Greetings students and welcome back to another lesson on calculus of variations. In this video I'm going to derive and discuss the second variation. I've briefly alluded to this in previous lectures, but let me go on the side and explain the whole idea behind the second variation using a function from simple calculus as an example. Say I have a function that looks something like this. If I wanted to find the points where the function was stationary, in other words, points where the function was not changing, then I could take the derivative of the function and set that to zero. Once I set it to zero, I can solve for the values of x where f of x is stationary. So to find stationary points, we set df by dx to zero and solve for x to get my solutions. Let's call one of those solutions x1. Now the analog to this equation in calculus of variations is the Euler-Lagrange equation. So in calculus of variations, if you want to find the stationary function of a functional, which is a function of functions, you solve the Euler-Lagrange equation. Let's get back to f of x. What if I wanted to find the nature of the stationary point x1? What if I wanted to know whether x1 was a local maximum, a local minimum, or a saddle point? How do I determine that nature? Well, I use the second derivative of f. If this second derivative is positive at x1, then x1 is a local minimum. If it's negative, then x1 is a local maximum. And if it's zero, then x1 is a saddle point. Now the main purpose of this video is to determine the calculus of variations analog to the second derivative. I want to develop a quantity which I'll call the second variation, and I want to use this quantity to tell me whether the stationary function I find from the Euler-Lagrange equation locally maximizes the functional or minimizes the functional. To set up the situation that will allow me to determine the second variation, I'm going to use much of what I used back in my Euler-Lagrange derivation video. So if you've seen that, this initial setup should be deja vu. Let's begin by supposing that we have two points a and b, given by x1, y1, and x2, y2 respectively. What we want to do first is find some function y equals f of x that makes the following functional or function of functions stationary. In addition to the fact that y makes this functional stationary, there's another condition that we have to take into account when determining y. And can you see what that is? It's the boundary conditions. At x1, our function y of x has to equal y1, and at x2, our function has to equal y2. So after this initial setup, we come to the derivation slash proof of the second variation. We will suppose that our desired function, which makes i stationary and which satisfies the relevant boundary conditions, is given by y. Another name for y is the extremal because it's the particular function that makes our functional stationary or extreme. Now what we're going to do is introduce a function eta of x. The only condition on eta is that it has to be zero at the boundaries x1 and x2. Otherwise, eta is just a completely random function. By the way, in this entire discussion, it's implied that these functions y, eta, and basically all the functions we're concerned with all have continuous second derivatives. Anyway, what we're going to do is define a new function y bar given by our extremal y plus some parameter epsilon times the arbitrary function eta. Essentially, y bar represents a variation in the extremal y, and because eta is an arbitrary function, you can conclude that by extension, y bar can also represent any arbitrary function. The only restriction on y bar arises from the restrictions we put on y and eta earlier on, and you can easily verify that because of these restrictions, y bar satisfies the exact same boundary conditions as y. Now because of the parameter epsilon and the arbitrary function eta, this y bar can be interpreted as a mathematical entity representing a whole family of curves. What I want to do is use the particular curve in this family that makes our functional i stationary. And by using this curve, I'll have used the appropriate function of x to construct my second variation. I don't want to substitute a non-stationary function for this second variation. I want to substitute the stationary function and use the second variation to determine the nature of that same stationary function. Notice that this quantity i depends only on the parameter epsilon. Why is that? Well, because the x gets integrated out from this definite integral. The y bar and y bar prime have x inside their expression. So once you integrate and apply your limits to end up with i, the only parameter or variable remaining in the final expression is the epsilon that's found in y bar and y bar prime. So my main objective here 
is to find the second variation of i, the analog to the second derivative. But since i only depends on epsilon, finding the second derivative of i is really just using this analog, determining d2i by d epsilon squared. This is just like single variable calculus. Now if you remember my Euler-Lagrange video, I used di by d epsilon there and set that to zero, just like I would in regular calculus with the first derivative. Now I'm just extending that logic to find the second variation based on the second derivative of i. Of course, I want to determine the second variation corresponding to the function that makes i stationary, and I get that function by setting epsilon to zero. Remember, the function y of x was already assumed to be stationary beforehand, and so it's easy to see that when epsilon equals zero, the particular curve that we end up for y bar is our stationary function y. The rest of the procedure in finding the second variation is quite similar to what we did for Euler-Lagrange. We substitute the i in terms of the integral, differentiate that integral expression twice with respect to epsilon, and find the second variation. Hopefully that should be fairly clear. So let's plug in the integral expression for i and take its second derivative with respect to epsilon. Since the integrand is nice, continuous, and differentiable, we can move this derivative inside the integral. And since the expression inside the integral is a function of multiple variables besides epsilon, variables that haven't yet been integrated out, this ordinary derivative outside the integral becomes a partial derivative inside the integral. I can then rewrite the second partial derivative as the partial derivative of the partial derivative. Should be relatively easy to take the first partial derivative since we already know the partial derivative of capital F with respect to epsilon from the original Euler-Lagrange derivation video. So using the chain rule, the partial derivative of capital F with respect to epsilon is given by di f di y bar times di y bar di epsilon plus di f di y bar prime times di y bar prime di epsilon. Now we want to find the partials of y bar and y bar prime with respect to epsilon. So to do that, let's use the expression for y bar that we defined above, which is just y plus epsilon eta. Now the derivative of y bar with respect to x or y bar prime is then given by y prime of x plus epsilon times eta prime of x. If I take the partial derivatives now of these expressions with respect to epsilon, I'll end up with eta and eta prime respectively, where eta of course is the function that creates the variation from the stationary function y. If we now plug in these partials into our second variation, here's what we end up with. Let's now take the second partial with respect to epsilon of the expression inside the brackets. Now the functions given by partial f partial y bar and partial f partial y bar prime are still functions of x, y bar, and y bar prime technically. So when we apply the chain rule to find the second variation, this is what we get for the partial f partial y bar, and then this is what we get for the partial f partial y bar prime. Now let's plug in the relevant partial derivatives for y bar and y bar prime to put everything in terms of eta. If we multiply everything out, here's what we end up with. We can then combine the common terms to get the following. Let's now apply the condition that epsilon is zero. When epsilon is zero, the y bar and y bar prime just become y and y prime respectively. So let's apply epsilon equals zero to the second variation integral. So this integral, which I'll call q from now on, represents our second variation. It's what we'll use to determine whether the stationary function y is a local minimum or local maximum of a functional. But how would we make this determination? Well, just like with single variable calculus, the stationary function for i is a minimum if the second variation or this q is positive. Similarly, the stationary function for i is a maximum if this second derivative, this second variation given by our integral, is negative. Now why should we just accept that this is true? Well, let me give you some intuition. If a function y makes the functional i stationary for epsilon equals zero, then that means i is not locally changing at that value of y. It's stationary after all. di by d epsilon at epsilon equals zero is zero. However, if the second derivative is positive, that means the derivative itself, the derivative di by d epsilon, is locally increasing at y. So we went from a negative derivative, a decreasing functional, to a zero derivative at y, to a positive derivative, creating an increasing functional. 
So this looks like a local minimum. So a positive second variation corresponds to a local minimum. The exact same logic can be used to relate negative second variations to local maxima. If the second derivative of i with respect to epsilon at epsilon equals zero is negative at our stationary function y, then the first derivative of i at epsilon zero is decreasing at y. So we go from a positive derivative to what we know is a zero derivative since we're at the stationary function to a negative derivative, a decreasing functional. This looks like a local maximum, which is why a negative second variation corresponds to a local maximum. Now using this intuition, we can propose conditions for stationary functions to be local minima. In order to guarantee that the integral will be positive for a local minimum function y, we can obviously propose that the integrand, the function being integrated, must be positive for all values of x between x1 and x2. And by specifying that the integrand is always positive, we pretty much guarantee that the integral q is also always positive. Another important condition is that this integrand must be positive no matter what non-trivial eta we pick. As long as that eta satisfies the boundary conditions that we originally specified, where its value at the limits of integration is zero, and as long as eta is not identically zero, we're okay. Similarly, for local maxima, in order to guarantee that our second variation integral must be negative, we could propose the condition that our integrand must be negative for all x within the limits of integration. This must also be true for all non-trivial functions eta that satisfy the boundary conditions. So now we have conditions for local maxima and minima in terms of our integrand, which means that once we find the integrand in our second variation and demonstrate that the integrand is either always positive or always negative for our integration limits given any arbitrary eta satisfying condition two, we know that our stationary function is either a local minimum or a local maximum. An important but somewhat discouraging note is that we can't really simplify the second variation any further to get rid of our eta prime. We have to deal with the second variation the way it is. There's no escape route via integration by parts like there was in the Euler-Lagrange equation video. On the bright side though, the conditions I proposed are really hard conditions. They can actually be relaxed somewhat using theorems we might prove later. Anyway, that should do it for this lesson. In the next video, I'll cover an example applying the second variation to an actual functional in order to determine the nature of its stationary function. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.